Our next speaker this morning is Professor Michel Maharbiz, and uh, he works on developing electronic interfaces to cells, to organisms, and brains. And he'll tell us about some of this work. Thanks. Okay. So uh, everybody can hear me. All right. So I, when uh, I was asked what I, you know to give a talk a uh, month ago, I uh, su you know suggested the bugs, or somebody asked if I would give a talk about the bugs. Uh, but since then, <clears throat> this other idea has kind of uh, taken hold of people's imagination. And so I'm going to kind of do something I shouldn't do, which is show you a few slides about the bugs, but really get into the neural dust. And hopefully, uh, this will, will excite you, because we do think it's, a, it's sort of a, parad a possible paradigm shift, and, and we're getting some interesting data out of it. Uh, this neural dust business was, was Sujay showed a slide of right at the beginning of, the, of this um, event. So uh, first, the bugs. Now let me say that this is, a, as all the things at Berkeley, it's a really big collaboration. Uh, for the neural dust, really this is uh, uh, the brainchild of myself, Alad Alon, Jose Carmena, and Jan Rabai. And DJ is the powerhouse that actually does it. And these are the bug guys, Josh, Travis, Keegan, and Jonathan, two of which are undergrads and do all of our real, pretty cool hardware stuff. And I want to plug uh, all of these guys here, including the Center for Neural Engineering, which has been instrumental in, in pushing a lot, a lot of these things forward. OK. So I'm, I'm going to talk like the Micro Machine guy for a minute, just so to show you some of the bug stuff. The bug stuff is sort of like maybe fun, serious fun. And then I'm going to switch gears a little bit and go into the neural dust. Um, and then let me get a sense of what time it is. OK. So first, the bugs. So uh, a few years ago now, we showed that uh, if we took living insects and we put little radios on them uh, with very tiny little batteries and knew where to stimulate the brain and the muscles, we could turn them on and off and fly them around little airplanes. OK, so this was work that was initially done in beetles. What's there is a cochlear implant battery. These beetles are very small. They're a centimeter and a half about. Uh, there's a tiny little microprocessor. It's very low power. comes out of Texas Instrument. And then you see these little wires. And there's one going right between the optic lobes. And there's two going uh, where the basilar muscles are. And there's a fourth one to dump current. And um, you know it was neat because no one could believe we'd done it. We then radio enabled these things and started flying them around with little Wii microcontrollers in, in, in big rooms full of the same tracking hardware that you use for Hollywood stop motion animation and did a lot of fun stuff like that. But it was fundamentally all stimulation of the musculature of the, or, or the brain responsible for pattern generating uh, motion. And since then, what, what happened um, is, well, let me show you a, a picture. This is just fun. People like to see these. Oh, you know what? What's interesting? You won't get any of the sound. Well, anyway, what we showed, this is the on and off stuff. I'm not usually I do an hour's worth of this stuff. We have tons of videos of these things flying. But what we showed was that we could find, we found the part of the brain that could uh, turn on and off the flight resonator of the wings of these things. And not only could you turn them on and off, you could amplitude modulate them so you could sort of throttle them in flight. And then you could disturb one side versus the other, and so you could get turning behavior. And then we flew them around in rooms, you know, showing that we could do this. So with your you know, uh, indulgence, I want to move to a couple more slides that show what we're doing these days. We're doing this in partnership uh, with Draper Laboratories, and it's, it's pretty exciting. And the reason I wanted to show you this was that most people don't know that this system even exists. And I thought you'd, you'd learn something. It'd be fun. And then I'll switch gears to neural dust. What we're doing these days with the insects is a little different. So it turns out that uh, insects that are good flyers, not all of them, but many of them, uh, don't just have two compound eyes, uh, the things we all think about as bug eyes, right? No, just these two bug eyes. They have uh, another type of light sensor. And that light sensor is not very appreciated. And there are those three dots. This is a grasshopper, an American grasshopper. Um, think of it as a locust, if you want. And you see the two big compound eyes and the antenna. But then there's these three little things. And these little things are UV sensitive. And they, uh, they, they don't have enough um, receptors to do any spatial discrimination. And uh, not a lot of people work on these, but it's generally hypothesized that what these things do is take the differential level of UV between these points to do head adjustments under the assumption that the insect that evolutionary has come to the conclusion there's more UV coming from above than below. OK? So what we've done, we looked at this, and we thought, this would be really cool. What if we felt fed this? these insects false information. And so you can imagine, here's the insect. And there's the usual place it's flying around in. And these ocelli generally have about that, you know, kind of, they kind of look, they can sort of discriminate light coming out like this. Like this. They can't really spatially do anything. They're just sort of simple light sensors. And so as the relative light levels change, the insect will adjust. 
Okay? So what we've done is, that was our, our hypothesis was that, that if we could figure out a way to feed this false information to the bugs, in fact, we could steer them very powerfully, much more powerfully than we would with the muscle stimulation. And so we built these systems. This is our very first homebrew system. You have to realize that this is incredibly tightly electronics. These things can't carry more than between 150 and 210 milligrams. So we've got to put everything on there. And it's got to stimulate the acelli in the front. This is our first one. Um, and then uh, working with our partners at Draper, we, we have a you know, more, more uh, uh, well-honed one. But the bottom line is that this actually worked incredibly well. And so what you're seeing here is uh, head twitches. But these head twitches, although they look small, for an insect this big as it's turning, you know, basically tur turn out to correlate to fairly uh, interesting trajectory changes. And so this was our, you know, some experiments on head rolls. And we've also shown that, in fact, as you would expect, as the head twitches, the body follows. And what we're in the middle of doing now is free flight tests. We're deep in the middle of these free flight tests trying to understand what we have to do to get uh, very, very uh, robust behavior every time just by taking a grasshopper, fitting this stuff on in about a one minute procedure, letting it go, and then flying it around. So this is a fun story about bugs and electronics. Um, you're more than welcome to ask me questions afterward. I love talking about that stuff. There's a whole part of my group that does it. But I wanted to talk about NeuroDust because I think, um, I think it's, it's a, a potentially a very impactful um, direction that we're headed in. So, okay, now brains. Now, before I talk about NeuroDust, I want to give you a little primer about a lot of stuff that's going on uh, to give you context and a little bit of an intro to, to why NeuroDust might matter a lot. So first of all, in about 30 seconds, it's a great time to be doing stuff that is tech for the brain. Not only are there big funding initiatives, it's in the ether, everyone's very excited, and I think that there's just a lot of attention by a lot of intelligent, talented people uh, being put into this at all scales. There's lots of ways to interact with the brain. Um, so we're pretty excited. So that's sort of big, big picture number one. Now, I want to point you to two uh, publicly available uh, papers uh, to kind of, if, if when you walk out of here, you want to know a little bit more and a little bit deeper. Um, one, which I, I, we worked on, was really motivated by George Church, um, was asking a, a kind of a simple question to, to phrase, but incredibly difficult to answer, which is the following. If you put at your disposal every, more or less every known uh, recording or intervention modality uh, that is available to get information out of a brain, uh, and you even are generous in uh, some you know, near-term extrapolations of how that technology will mature, is it feasible to record from every neuron in a mouse brain? So that's the first paper. It's an archive. It's a really interesting paper. Um, these guys did a really good job. We were involved in this whole thing. You can see there's a lot of people. The second one is NeuroDust. And so our, when we first put this out, and I'm going to sketch out the argument in this paper in detail now, um, we put this out on archive to kind of invite the community to, to opine and sort of feedback. It's been very, very productive. And the idea behind this, as I will sketch out in a minute, is is there a conceivable way of recording very high resolution, spatial temporal resolution data from a mammalian cortex uh, without needing things that are embedded in the cortex? And I'm going to give you a, a little bit of a sketch of why that's important. Um, and then kind of give you a sketch of how we think we can do it. Um, so here's a. Here's a brain. The cortex, the areas that, that are relevant for the purposes of this discussion are basically right near the periphery of the top of the brain, sort of where, where all these you know, multiple layers of neurons meet and do this incredibly dense webbing uh, that allows you to, you know, motor cortex around you run your, your various motor functions, and there's sensory, and there's auditory, and there's all sorts of areas of the cortex. Um, and so we're really trying to access those first few millimeters of cortex. There's a lot of deep stuff that goes on there, OK? OK. So next little bit of tutorial is that if I, here's, a, here's a neuron. Uh, this is shamelessly taken from Google with a little photo editing, but basically a neuron. And as you all may remember from school, uh, a neuron will transmit information uh, across synapses. When two neurons meet, there's a, there's a cleft, and they exchange chemi chemicals through that. But the communication along the, pro the neural body, it's of the process, right, along the neuron, is really an electrochemical phenomenon. It's basically the neuron shuttling ions. And if the right things happen, there's this nonlinear effect that we call a spike. This thing fires. And this fire, this spike, propagates down the neuron till the next connection that matters. And many, you know, usually there's many, many of these connections, OK? And so for a long time, people have um, made electrical recordings of these things. And one way you do it is you do very elegant what's called patch clamping or intracellular recording. 
recording where you try to get some probe into the neuron, right, to figure out exactly what uh, changes, electrical changes, potential changes are measurable. This is a very difficult thing. And so by and large, for many, many decades, well, several decades, I would say about three decades, uh, w the workhorse of electrophysiology f that may be clinically relevant, that matters, you know, that can be done uh, for a clinical setting, and also neuroscience, is to do an extracellular recording, which is basically just putting, this is very crude, it's a cartoon, but putting two electrodes outside the cell uh, and, trying to, and trying to detect the tiny changes that happens when the cell itself is firing. It's like listening from the outside. Now, usually these things actually look like this, which is the, the counter electrode or the ground, if you want to think about it that way, it's very far away. Uh, to maximize this difference, and you've got one that's as close as you can possibly get it without doing any puncturing of the neuron. The problem, of course, is that this neuron is really surrounded by many, many, many of its neighbors, and all the processes are tangled like spaghetti, and so when you listen, if you happen to be lucky, you got one very close, you'll see these spikes, but very often you see the cacophony of firing around, and so there's a lot of, there are a lot of techniques for trying to deal with this. But this is how you do it, this is how you do extracellular recording, when you're trying to listen, watch neurons spike. Um, I'm going to skip, I'm going to table any discussion about optical methods. You could ask me afterward if, if you uh, would like to know um, and how they're sort of relevant to the story. So now if you're going to do this and people have been building technologies like this for a long time, what do you need, right? Well, you, you need to be able to see the signal you want. These are these spikes. Sometimes you even are, it's good enough to see groups of spikes. Um, you want to see as many as you can to, to kind of get as much information as you can. Most importantly, in my opinion, and for, for the, the story I'm going to tell you, you need to be able to do this for a long time. Because no one's going to let you, you know, no matter how ill they may be, uh, it's going to be very difficult to convince someone to open their central nervous system to you uh, for something that in a year will be, will be gone, will be dead, will be useless, right? will break or, or whatever. Um, part of that story has to do with how these materials interact with the brain, how the neurons respond to them and how they respond to the neurons over time. You don't want to pr produce, uh, provide a route of infection so having wires through the skull, no matter how well that's done, is eventually a route for something to creep in. Um, you don't want to do a lot of insertion damage, so you should know that heavily uh, um, you know, innervated uh, tissue is also heavily vascularized. And so when you shove a needle to record, you're also popping blood vessels. Um, and ideally, you would like to allow awake, untethered behavior, right? You don't want to have this thing following you around like in the movies. The way that, that uh, it, this is conventionally done is things like this. Right? This is a snapshot of the field. I tried to be representative. They're basically these arrays that are used to, are pushed into cortex, um, sort of a bed of needles. And these have been amazingly successful. There have been very, very, you know, many of you may know about the BrainGate trials, just amazing work. Um, but they all, you know, here's an, an example of one about to be pushed into the cortex. You've resected the membrane that protects your brain. Be above here, you don't see it, but there's this sort of craniotomy, and then this thing is sort of pushed in and, uh, you know, slowly, and then it, the whole thing is closed up and you, you, you record and, and maybe stimulate. Okay, so far so good. The, the problem is that, uh, so, so where this is, is this, this is going is certainly people are thinking about, and, and Medtronic already has a system, and there's lots of players, you know, it's growing very quickly because of the money I was talking about. Uh, where it's going is more and more channels, right? I want more and more of these things, and I want them wire. I want some wireless uh, capability. So I'd like to have a little radio so I can close the, the skull and I can kind of listen to the radio from the outside. Whether that's RFID-ish near-field coupling or it's something else, we can you know we can um, go into details. But basically, they today's look like this, and it, a lot of people are moving to something like that cartoon. This is from work out of here out of Berkeley, but it's basically, you know, here you see the needles and then you see coils and things that are going to couple outside. There's a problem, though, with following this, which is that you need a certain amount of space and power for the front end that records these things. Ignoring all the radio stuff, you, 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 you need, you know, there's constraints given to you by electronics. So for example, the smallest front end that's been published is about this big. That's the, by front end, I mean the electronics, the, the silicon that's required to record and digitize these things. And the lowest power published also out of, out of Berkeley is about two and a half microwatts per channel. Okay, so keep those numbers in mind when I launch into my little tail. Okay, a couple of microwatts per channel, a couple hundred microns. Now, the, an idea that's been around for a long time is maybe we could do RFID into the brain. Maybe we could put something in there 
that has a little coil, and just like my car in the subway uh, talks to something, we do near field coupling into the brain. And so we showed in this archive paper, just as a zeroth level thing, that this is not going to work for very tiny things. It just isn't. So if you can look here, this is link efficiency as a function of dimension. As I make the thing that's in the brain tinier and tinier, so you can see for about a centimeter, not bad, but millimeter starts to get bad. And if you go smaller than that, uh, all bets are off. So any dream of having very tiny things dispersed in the brain that would record without needing all these wires and without running into these limits of of, of uh, getting everything aggregated and radioed out. Uh, any dream of doing that with electromagnetics, uh, the radio frequency variety uh, pretty quickly run into problems. And for those of you that like to see numbers like this, about 10 gigahertz frequency, if you were to be, you know, try to do some very, very high frequency thing, even if you go higher, this, you can see that you get just really big losses, okay, for 100 micron size thing. So uh, e RF, RFID to tiny things in the cortex isn't gonna work. But there is a system that we think will work, and this is the, the nutshell of, of what I want to talk about. Um, so what we've proposed and worked out in quite a lot of detail in the archive paper and now have data, and I'm going to show you, this is the first time I'm showing anybody, we're showing anybody data. We were talking last night, should we show this? So we'll show you a couple. This is now in review in, in manuscript. Um, is a different way of talking uh, to things in the brain. And, and here's the trick, and I'll, I'll then go into, I'll tell you what the trick is, and I'll go into it. The, um, the trick is, Electromagnetics aren't very good at these scales because of the, basically because of the speed of light. And I'll get into this in a minute. But ultrasound is great. And so what we're effectively proposing is a system where many, many, many very tiny little things, tiny meaning hundreds of microns or smaller, are embedded in the cortex, in the first few millimeters of cortex. And just above the cortex, there's something that talks to them and is much larger on the order of centimeters, and that can talk outside the skull. But the magic happens right there between that thing that's sitting in the, the, what we call the neural dust inside. And the way they talk to each other is through ultrasound. And so I want to I wanna sketch that out for you. Okay? So here's the, here's the idea. Um, you have something in the brain, that tiny little cube over there, that can ring up uh, when hit with an ultrasonic wave. Something outside can produce that wave. That's that blue carrier. That's, it's literally ultrasound. It's uh, megahertz uh, frequency ultrasound. That little cube can actually begin to ring, resonate uh, like a tuning fork at that frequency. Because that little cube uh, is nominally a piezo, there's other things you can consider, but the basic cartoon is a piezo. As it does this, it prov produces a voltage and, in fact, can transduce the mechanical energy into uh, electrical energy. This is a trick that's used in other domains. And then, as I'll show you, there's a very simple front end that effectively can change or dampen, if you want to think about it that way, change that, that wiggle as a function of the nearby neuron spiking. It's a very simple idea. And as it does this, it effectively changes the reflected wave. It essentially messes with the incoming carrier in a back, it's called backscatter. It's used for your RFID. This is basically ultrasonic RFID. And as it does this, the thing that's sending the wave can hear the differences, the differences in amplitude, and infer what the spiking is. And it's all done through ultrasound and through a couple of little things I want to talk to. So that's a nice cartoon, but uh, there are some interesting challenges. So the first question is, 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 is my story even reasonable for the, on the power side? Can I couple things in at this scale? And the answer is absolutely yes. So that red curve is the one I already showed you for EM. The blue curve is if you try to do it with ultrasound. And so basically the, the trick is what's up here. So the low acoustic velocity of sound in the brain means that you have uh, wavelengths that are very tiny for the frequencies we're putting in, wavelengths that are comparable to the size of things we're talking about, which means the coupling efficiency is very high. Additionally, loss through the brain, uh, ultrasonic loss uh, through the brain is much lower than for, you, uh, for ultrasound than for EM. In other words, you, the, the tissue absorbs a lot less of it. And you guys int intrinsically, I think, know this. The ultrasound will pretty much go through. Uh, electromagnetics will, will pretty quickly get absorbed, OK? Part of the reason people get paranoid about putting phones here. Um, and so to give you some numbers that then I'll you know, kind of validate with data, um, even for very tiny, tiny things, uh, you have pretty, uh, pretty good link efficiency. So you're talking about uh, for a 100 micron thing, 7% you know, you efficiency doesn't sound like a lot, but given the amount of power you can uh, safely put in, you can really pick up on order of tens to hundreds of microwatts. So you can really couple in enough power to drive the little bit of electronics you need uh, to do something useful, okay? But now there's a problem. So that sounds all great for power, but there's a problem. 
And the problem is very subtle. And only, you know, you really, if you do this, you see it at one point. So the way you do extracellular recording, as I showed you in the cartoon, is I put one probe here and another one really, really far away. And the reason you do this is to get the maximum possible voltage difference when a neuron is firing next to this working probe over here, this electrode, right? The potentials are differentials between two points. When I instead am forced to put the two little electrodes that are plus and minus, both of them right next to that neuron, okay, the signal that is being generated outside is very small. It drops off, in fact, exponentially. So basically, as the distance of these two things gets closer and closer, the actual number of microvolts difference between these two things that a nearby neuron is causing is very small. And the reason is because the neuron has a membrane and it's really shuttling things in and across its own membrane. The things you're listening to are really incidental. They're almost like kind of the ionic currents that result in that are what you listen and you infer that you know, something has spiked. You don't really have a probe inside the neuron. So the problem is as you make things smaller, the power may, may look good, but your, uh, your uh, voltage difference is very small. And at some point you're gonna hit a, a thermodynamics. You're gonna hit the thermal noise level of all of this and you're not gonna be able to hear anything, right? And so we did a very careful look at this. Um, and so basically what happens as you scale this down, there's three lines on there that matter really. Uh, there's the green line which says that as this scales down to maintain a certain signal noise ratio, to be able to hear these things we're looking for, it takes more and more power. The blue line is the one I already showed you which is as I make things smaller, I get less power into them. It may look great but you know, of, we're actually getting less power. That's the blue line. And then the yellow line is the, really the, the thermal limit. I mean, you can't, if you get them to much, much smaller than this, you just run into problems where there's just an absolute minimum. There's just noise, right? There's just little wiggles in, in, the, in, the, in the junk around the electrode in the, in, the, in the ions. And so what it really looks like is right about, a, you know, maybe 50 microns for this cartoon I've shown you, uh, it will become physically impossible to pull, pull this off. So now the question is, is it physically possible to do it for things larger? This is great news, right? Because 50 microns is pretty tiny, and then I'll show you actually a way you can keep going. But could it, is, we wanted to know, okay, this looks great. Is it, is, can we actually do it? So I'm gonna uh, skip this in the interest of time. This is actually, for those of you that like you know, layout transistors, there's an additional scaling argument you have to make that really asks the question, for the transistor, the size that I can fit on something that's small, given constraints given by real CMOS foundries, uh, do, do, do I run into problems? And I'll skip this because it effectively says that we're okay. So you can ask me if you like building transistors. Now, the last point is, what the heck is listening to the neurons? Okay, and what's listening is a very simple trick because we can't put an entire normal front amplifier plus analog digital converter, you know, plus a powering loop, plus the thing that's gonna connect to the people, the usual, what's called the front end, the usual rigmarole of, of, of on a chip per channel, we can't fit that on this. And we certainly would, it would be very difficult to operate it efficiently for lots of very little technical reasons. But um, what it turns out is you can play a trick with a very fairly large, I mean large, you know, we're talking about microns, so that's very large, uh, a fairly large FET. Um, and the idea there is simply that if I have a, a, a transistor whose gate, that's the thing that you modulate to get a switch going, if you have that gate exposed to the juice as one of the electrodes and you have the other side that right between those two little red resistors exposed, actually the, the, the little changes that happen when a neuron fires are sufficient for that FET to modulate its cur the current that it runs through it, and that current is enough to dampen that little tuning fork. That, that cube is this little tuning fork of piezo material. I didn't get into that very much because you know, this is sort of a sketch, but the way you want to think about it is you, you, there are crystals of, and many of you know this, there are crystals of, of material that will resonate at particular you know, sort of pressure waves, right? So we, you can make them that they'll resonate at 10 megahertz, 20 megahertz, very old stuff, and so you have this little crystal wiggling, like a tuning fork. And as it wiggles, it produces a, a voltage on the plates. There's more to it than that, of course. You know, there's very intense modeling that went into this and a lot of details that have to do with how you would make this, but that's, that's fundamentally what's happened. So, What's happening is a wave comes in, this thing starts to vibrate. If there's any ne nearby neuronal spiking, this transistor will effectively act to change the way it's wiggling. So you can imagine a tuning fork going ee, ee, ee. It's just, but, but now it's a very small amount. So now the question is, okay, if I do this, what kind of changes do I actually get? And this is what I'm gonna show you because they're infinitesimal, they're very tiny. So we've, we built some prototypes. This is, this is all real-time stuff. This is actually, in, in fact, in, in uh, review right now. 
So we built them. There you see the piezo. We, we wanted to test the idea with just discrete transistors on the back. The entire footprint of that whole unit is about um, a millimeter, and the smallest one of these that we tested was about 127 microns. So very, very small, but not the tiny thing. You know, we, we haven't bothered to integrate the whole thing yet because we want to test the physics. We want to know if this works. So there you go. That's the real thing there to, on a PCB board. And the, the amazing, the cool news is this really looks like it follows exactly our, our calculations. And so this is data showing the transfer efficiency of power to a moat for sizes down to about 120 microns. You can ring these things up. You can power them, all, you can power them up. You get pretty much the power we expected. They resonate at the frequencies we thought they would. We, we, we built these for about 6 megahertz for, for the data I'm showing you. And now the next question is, and I'm going to start wrapping up, the next question is, when you fire them, do they chirp back with enough power that you can hear them? And again, the amazing thing is, it looks like you do. So this plot is showing basically the percent change on the carrier in parts per million. That's a ridiculously small number, right? So 10 to the 0 would be one part per million change on the carrier wave that the interrogator hears on the, on the, on the, the one that's emitting the sound. That's what it, it hears. But in fact, you can, you, you can actually hear it. You can actually pick this out. And so now what we're doing is, we're, we're, we're putting all this together, we're building the first little packages of these, and we, our current plan is effectively to be in uh, first animal tests sometime in the summer with something on order of you know, maybe 120 or so microns on a side as a starter. The, between that and 250, we're kind of deciding. Um, so that's, that's where we're going. I want to show you one more cartoon. So this is very exciting. This is, I think, why we wanted to talk about it today. It looks like this whole uh, idea works. Uh, the last story is, in fact, it's not as grim. The, the engineering constraints are not as grim as you might think because there's an additional trick we can play. And it brings together the kind of things we do very well here, which is nanofabrication, microfabrication, and, and the electronics. So that cube with a little piece of, of, of electronics on top with the two little red uh, squares that listen, those are the two electrodes, that's this, the story I've been selling you, I've been telling you so far. Uh, but there's a wrinkle you can add to it, which is by adding an incredibly thin a, a printed flexible tail to this that would be on order of about a micron, maybe maybe let's go crazy and say five microns, six microns to be you know, and s some distance you know some some length maybe 50 microns, maybe 100 like microns. You would make a little thing that looks like a tadpole. The tail would really uh, matter very little. But here's the trick: it allows you to put one electrode very far from the other and breaks that scaling uh, floor that I mentioned before. In other words, as I, I can stretch these things away from each other, I don't, I don't have as much constraint on, oh, it's a tiny signal that these two things will hear. The signal should be larger, which also eases off the constraints that I was showing you. So the, 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 the story may be actually a bit uh, uh, even more optimistic than we thought with something, something like this. So. Uh, where, this is kind of where I, I, I stop. The, this, the, the bug story is all a lot of fun. I'm, I'm willing to take questions and show you more movies. I've got tons and tons of those things. Um, the neural dust story, I think, is a big deal. I think that um, uh, it was possible because we've got all of this expertise here in all of these domains. You think about it, this needed to bring together domains in you know, very, very high end, low power, ultra compact circuit design. Uh, in all of the bioengineering and biointerfacing stuff, we needed to have access to animal models, and we needed to have very deep understanding of how these, the, this neural tissue works to even pick out these little details that they're all very you know, deep engineering subtleties. The story, I think, is we, we, we are hoping to demonstrate a completely untethered 100 micron scale recording node inserted into cortex sometime this year uh, watching firing events, which I think would be a really big deal for clinical applications, because it means that uh, you can start to look down the road and being able to put recording channels into someone, for example, that wants a neuroprosthetic or needs a neuroprosthetic, whether that be motor, speech, uh, hearing, and have something that, that didn't require you puncturing the cortex um, uh, permanently. So certainly, I didn't talk about delivery, but you, you put these things in and you just everything gets closed up on that surgery and you're done. Uh, you don't need anything that's sitting in there with a circuit, with wires coming out, with a craniotomy out to the outside, and any variation of that. So we're pretty excited, um, for, particularly for brain-machine interfaces. So with that, I will say thank you, and uh, I'll take questions. Yeah. How do you scale up? 
Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Um, we have like 40 slides on that, and I didn't want to, you know, say, otherwise I keep talking. So the question was, how do you scale up to many, many sensors? So there's lots of ways. So uh, let me sketch out a couple. Uh, one is frequency binning. So you can make these transducers actually, each of them sit at a slightly different frequency, and your interrogator can be broadband. And so, well, relatively wideband, not broadband. And so effectively, you could pick out multiple, multiple frequency channels. Um, you can also, what we'll very likely will have to do, in, even independent of this question, is not have a single interrogator, but have effectively an array that can do beam steering. And this is done right now for a lot of high-end ultrasound. You have a multiple elements n by m array that does beam steering. And so with beam steering, you can do spatial localization. And so basically what we've done some of the numbers, for, with, with beam steering and frequency binning, you could basically pull out hundreds of channels, and that's pretty much all you want for BMI right now. So that'll, that'll hit the BMI target, which is what we're going for. We're not trying to record everything out of your brain, by the way, because this generated a lot of crazy hype in articles, and so I, sh I should have said this, I forgot. We are not trying to read your mind. This has nothing to do with recording millions of neurons at the same time. Anyway, thanks for the question. Okay, thank you.